So you have here a marvelous microcosm. You have a political and social analog of the manifestation and withdrawal of the worlds, of the Lord playing the game, or the self playing the game of being all of us, and then as each individual reaches moksha, the self realizes in terms of an individual life that it is the self. So exactly in this way, the child representing the self on the way in comes into this world, plays around for a while. <coughs> there are four castes, just as there are four yugas to the Kalpa cycle, you remember? And then out it goes, back to the forest. We would say back to nature. But you see, the outgoing stage of Vanaprastha is a much higher state in the course of evolution than the hunting uh, society person who is primitive. He isn't simply going back to where he came from. He's spiraled. He's come round to an equivalent position, but at a higher level. And what he has gained in the interim is self-awareness. I mean that too in the ordinary sense when we speak of self-consciousness. See, it's not much fun to be happy and not know it. We need a certain resonance. Self-consciousness is an echo in our heads, an echo of what we do, but wouldn't be aware of doing it if there wasn't an echo. When you see yourself in a mirror, that mirror is a visual echo of your face. And that's why in a room such as this, it's a very comfortable room for me to talk in because it has resonance. And so self-consciousness is neurological resonance. Now you know how troublesome resonance can get if it's not properly worked out. You can get echoes that just won't stop. So you go into a great cave somewhere and you say, Hi! It says, Hi, 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 all up in the distance. See? That's very confusing. Now that's the sort of snarl that self-consciousness can get into, and we call it anxiety. When I keep, keep, keep thinking, did I do the right thing in the course of some performance? If I'm constantly aware of myself in a kind of anxious, critical way, my resonance becomes too high, and so I get confused and jittery. But if you learn that self-consciousness has limits, that self-awareness cannot possibly enable you to be free of making mistakes, you can learn to be spontaneous in spite of being self-aware and enjoy the echo. So what happens, that having developed self-consciousness through education, through work with other people, having developed all the disciplines of the culture, the Vanaprastha then becomes again as a child. But then, you see, he has what Freud says the child has from the beginning. Freud called it the oceanic feeling. And the oceanic feeling is the sensation of being one with the universe. The Vanaprastha gets that back. But it's not a child's oceanic feeling. It's an adult's oceanic feeling, something which the psychoanalysts don't discuss. Because according to them, all oceanic feelings are regressive. But if there is a mature oceanic feeling, as contrasted with the immature oceanic feeling of the child, which is as different as the oak is from the acorn. And so you can have this sensation, you see, 
of total unity with the cosmos, of the, shall I call it, expansion to infinity or contraction to infinity of your identity, without forgetting society's game rules with regard to you. In other words, it doesn't mean that you forget your address, telephone number, social security number, and the name you were given. You remember all that. And you can play that game when necessary. But you know it's a game. So, there is no way, as a matter of fact, of escaping from playing these games. And the only thing is that when you find out, you see, that you are thoroughly selfish, you inquire, what is it, what is the self that I love? What is this thing that I'm so interested in advancing and in protecting? And you look very closely in to what you feel when you think you feel yourself. And you know what you find out? that yourself is everything that you thought was someone else or something else. You have no knowledge of yourself, you see, except in relation to others. Self and other are as inseparable as back and front. There is no knowledge of self without the knowledge of otherness. There is no knowledge of the voluntary without the knowledge of the involuntary, of can without can't. So they go together. And that going together of self and other is non-duality, that's Advaita. That is the self with a capital S. So through self, one finds deliverance. So finally we come to the last consideration, which is the question, in what way and by what means can an individual who is under the impression that he is a separate individual, limited by and enclosed in his bag of skin, how can such a person effectively realize that he is deep down the universal self, the Brahman? This, of course, is a curious question. It proposes a journey to the place where you already are. Now it's true that you may not know that you are there, but you are. And if you take a journey to the place where you are, you will visit many other places than the place where you are, and perhaps when you find through some long experience that all the places you go to are not the place you wanted to find, you, it may occur to you that you were already there in the beginning. And that is the dharma, or method, as I translated that word, which all gurus, teachers of spiritual development, use fundamentally. They are all of them tricksters, but in the most beneficent sense of the word trickster. Why trickster? Because, do you know, it's terribly difficult, in fact it's impossible, to surprise yourself on purpose. And yet, to be surprised is a great thing. But you can't plan a surprise for yourself. Somebody else can do it for you. And that is why so often a guru or teacher is necessary in this process. But let me say right from the start that a guru, there are many kinds of gurus. First of all, among human gurus, there are square gurus and there are beat gurus. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
There are gurus like, uh, well, let's say a great Zen master today. Let's take Oda Roshi at Daitokuji, who is a square guru and a very good one. But you go through regular channels. Then there is a guru like uh, Mr. Gurdjieff, who is a rascal guru who leads you in by means that are very, very strange indeed. Then there are gurus that are not people. The gurus may be situations, a certain kind of problem or encounter. Even a book can to some extent be a guru. A friend can be a guru. I've often thought of writing a story about a man who is some sort of uh, guru seeker and uh, potential yogi who goes one day into an automat and sits down at a table where there is another fellow and he sort of thinks that this man looks wise and he projects onto him the idea that he is a guru and he says I feel there's something special about you and the man says oh really uh, really, actually, there's nothing special about me. I happen to be an insurance salesman. <laughs> and this other fellow says, isn't that fascinating how modest he is? <laughs> <laughs> and then I want to develop this story. Step by step, they keep meeting each other because they both eat at the same automat regularly for lunch. And uh, although the, uh, the fellow really is an insurance salesman and doesn't know a thing about these things, it in the end results in the enlightenment of the person who projected this image upon him. <laughs> so there are, as I say, many kinds of guru. But the problem of the guru is to show the inquirer in some effective way that he already has what he's looking for. Now, in Hindu traditions, the realization of who you really are is called basically sadhana. And sadhana means uh, the discipline, the, uh, the way of life that it's necessary to follow in order to escape from the illusion that you are merely a in skin-encapsulated ego. And sadhana comprises uh, yoga, from the root yug, which means to join. And so from that, in Latin, we get yungari, to join. And in English, junction, and also yoke. And Junction is also the word union, you see. All this derives from the Sanskrit root, yug. A yoke is also a discipline. When you yoke oxen, that is a kind of a discipline. Now, strictly speaking, in the very strictest sense, yoga means the state of union, the state in which the individual self uh, what is called uh, the Jivatman. Jivatman is approximately translatable as ego. Jivatman finds that it is ultimately Atman, which equals Brahman, the Supreme Self. So yoga is the state the strictest meaning of yoga is the state of union and a yogi means one who has realized that union. But we find that the word is not normally used in that way, in that strict sense. Yoga in the normal way of use means the practice of meditation whereby one comes into the state of union and the yogi means one who is a traveler, a seeker, 
who is on the way to that point. But again, strictly speaking, there is no method to arrive at the place where you are. And no amount of searching will uncover the self. Because all searching implies the absence of the self, the big self, the self with a capital S. So that to seek it is to thrust it away. And to practice a discipline to attain it is to postpone realizing. There is a famous Zen story told of a monk who was sitting in meditation and the master came along and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm meditating to become a Buddha. Whereupon the master picked up a brick that was lying nearby and started polishing it, rubbing it. And the monk said, what are you doing? He said, I'm rubbing this brick to make it a mirror. He said, by no amount of rubbing could you ever make a brick into a mirror. The master replied, by no amount of zazen could you become a Buddha. Zazen means sitting meditation. Uh, they react very badly to this story in modern day Japan. <laughs> anyway, what is important, you see, quite radically here, this guy does the same thing, but it's in a different dimension. You've done it. Hmm? <laughs> now, what, what, what did you do? See, the, the real crime is that you won't admit you're God. <laughs> That's false modesty. <laughs> <laughs> so the guru challenges, you see. He challenges you. If you raise the question, he doesn't go out and preach in the streets say, come on, everybody, you ought to be converted. He sits down under a tree and waits. Mm -hmm. And people start coming around, and they offer him propositions. He answers back. And he challenges you in any way that he thinks is appropriate to your situation. Now, if you've got a thin shell and your mask is easily dispatched with, he simply uses a, what we might call an easy method. He says, listen, Shiva, come off it. Don't pretend you're this guy here. I know who you are. And the guy, to understand yoga, you need to get hold of a good translation of Patanjali, the Yoga Sutra. Uh, I don't know which is the best translation. There are so many of them. It says it starts out, now yoga is explained. Mm -hmm. First verse. And the commentators say now has a special meaning because it follows from something else that you're supposed to know beforehand. That you're supposed to be, in other words, a civilized human being before you start out on yoga. We don't teach yoga to baboons. And so you're supposed to have been disciplined in artha, karma, and dharma. In politics, sensuality, and dharma, justice. And then you can start yoga. Then the next verse is, yogas chitta briti niroda, which means yoga is the cessation of revolutions of the mind. In other words, uh, you can interpret that at many levels. Chitta, meaning consciousness, like a pool, like water, like a reflecting pool. If there are waves on that, it doesn't reflect, it breaks up all the reflections. So stop the waves on the mind and it will reflect reality clearly. Get a perfectly calm mind. That's one meaning of it. Or another meaning of it is stop thinking. Eliminate all 
contents from the mind, all thoughts, all feelings, all sensations, everything. How will you do that? Well, it goes on to say you do it by certain steps. First of all, pranayama, which means the control of the breath. Pratyahara, which means preliminary concentration. Tarana, a more intense form of concentration. Jhana, which is the same jhana is Sanskrit for Zen, and that means profound union between subject and object, and finally samadhi, which is uh, way out. Now what's happening here? Control your mind. First of all, by breathing. Breathing is a very strange thing because breathing can be viewed both as an involuntary and as a voluntary action. You can feel I breathe and yet you can feel it breathes me. And they have all sorts of fancy breathing ways in yoga. They are very amusing to practice because you can get very high on them. So they set you at these tricks. And of course, if you are bright, you may begin to realize some things at that point. If you are not very bright, then you'll have to go on. And so next they really get to work on concentration. Concentrate the mind on one point. Now this can be an absolutely fascinating undertaking. I suggest that uh, you try it this way if you want to make experiments. Select a, a highlight on some bright, uh, some polished surface, copper or glass or something, where there's a little tiny reflection, say of a candle or an electric light bulb. Look at it and put your eyes out of focus so that the bright spot appears to be fuzzy. A fuzzy circle. Now look very carefully at the design in the fuzzy circle and see if you can make it out. There is a definite pattern of blur and you can have a wonderful time looking at that. Then go back, get your eyes into focus, and look at intense light. And you can go into it, and into it, and into it, like you know you're falling down a funnel. And at the end of that funnel is this intense light. And go down, go in, 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 in. It's the most thrilling experience. Then suddenly the guru wakes you up and says, what are you doing that for? Well, because I want realization. Why? Because we live in a world of, uh, if we identify ourselves with the ego, we get into trouble, we suffer, we, we're in a mess. He says, are you afraid of that? Yes. So then, all that you're doing to practice yoga is based on fear. You're just escaping, you're running away. How do you think you can get realization through fear? There's one to think about. So you think, well, now I've got to go on with my yoga practice, my concentrations, my exercises, but not for a fearful motive. And you know that guru, you know, he's watching you, and he's a very, very sensitive man, and he knows when you're doing, you know, he always knows what your motive is. So he puts you onto the kick of getting a pure motive. And uh, that means very deep control of the emotions. I mustn't have impure thoughts. All right, so you go along and you manage to repress as many impure thoughts as possible, and then one day he asks you, why are you repressing these thoughts? What's your motive for trying to have a pure mind? 
and you find out that you had an impure motive for trying to have a pure mind. That you did it for the same old reason you started out the thing in the beginning, because you were afraid, because you wanted to play, get one up on the universe. And so, uh, eventually, you find out, you see, that your mind is what is called in Sanskrit uh, mudra, mudra, which means crazy. Because it can only go in vicious circles. Everything it does to get out of a trap puts it more securely in the trap. Every step in the direction of liberation is a new tie-up. So that you started, you know, with molasses in one hand and feathers in the other. That was the original situation of man. The guru made you put them together. <laughs> See, like that. And said, now pick the feathers off. <laughs> and the more it is, the more of a mess the whole thing gets. So you get involved and involved and involved by this process. And he, in the meantime, you see, has been telling you, yes, you made a little attainment today, but it was only the eighth stage and there are 64 altogether. And you've got to get to that 64th stage. And he knows how to spin it out and uh, drag it all out because you are ever hopeful that you'll get that thing, just as you might win a prize or win a special job or a great distinction and be somebody. That's the motivation all along, only it's very spiritual here. It's not for worldly recognition. You want to be recognized by the gods and the angels. But it's the same story on a higher level. So he keeps holding out these baits. And uh, as long as the pupil falls for them, he, he holds out more baits until after a while the pupil gets the realization that what he's doing is running faster and faster in a squirrel cage. That he's making an enormous amount of progress and getting nowhere. Like in Alice Through the Looking Glass when the queen says, here you have to ha run faster and faster to stay where you are. And so he impresses this upon you by these methods very thoroughly. And at last you find out that you, as an ego, as what you ordinarily call your mind, are a mess. That you, you just can't do this thing. You can't do it by any of the means that have been held out to you. You can concentrate, yes, you've acquired a considerable power of concentration by doing all this, but you find you're doing it for the wrong reason. And there's no way of doing it for the right reason. See, Krishnamurti does this. He's a very, very clever guru. 